the Ballet Help Desk podcast. My name is Jenny, and I am joined by my co-founder, Brett. We are both proud ballet moms who met backstage at our children's recital. During our kids' training, we found that resources were limited. We relied mostly on Dance Magazine and parents in the lobby for information. Now that our kids are embarking on their professional careers, we're excited to share our combined 20-plus years of experience as ballet moms with all of you. We'll be bringing in experts to help make sense of this complex world of ballet training. It's back to school for dancers too. So while you're out buying new backpacks and notebooks, be sure to check out our Refresh Your Dance Bag Guide with some of your dancers' favorite products with discounts up to 25% off select items exclusively for our Ballet Help Desk family. Head over to BalletHelpDesk.com to find some of your favorite brands like Orza, Bodil, and Alev, just to name a few. And don't forget to pick up our Ballet Corrections Journal. It is a must-have to start your year off on the right foot. Hello, welcome back. We're so excited to kick off our career planning series with Cecilia Elisiu. She is a principal dancer with Pacific Northwest Ballet and has had a 14-year career as a professional ballerina, teacher, and mentor. She trained at School of American Ballet and has performed notable roles on stages in the U.S., France, Canada, and Nigeria by George Balanchine, Davis Dawson, William Forsyth, Jose Limon, Jean Christophe Malloy, Crystal Pite, Lexei Redbansky, and Jerome Robbins, to name a few. Cecilia ha- has become a leader in the ballet education with the establishment of the PNB School Mentorship Program, as well as the founding Global Ballet Teachers and Ballet Life Coach. Cecilia has over a decade of teaching experience, giving masterclasses and workshops in the U.S., Ghana, Honduras, and Nigeria. She holds a bachelor's degree from Fordham University and is continuing her education at Harvard Business School as part of the Crossover into Business program. So without further ado, please help us welcome Cecilia. Hello, and welcome back to the Ballet Help Desk. I'm Brett, and I am joined by my co-founder, Jenny. And we are so fortunate today to be joined by Cecilia Ileskiu. She is a principal dancer with Pacific Northwest Ballet, and she is also the founder of Ballet Life Coach, which is a career counseling service for dancers that are just getting into the job market. So Cecilia, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we want to jump right in. Can you tell us a little bit why you started Ballet Life Coach? Yeah, what a fun journey. So it all started during COVID. And my one of my colleagues at PNB had proposed to the school to start a mentorship program that connected the school and the company. And we had proposed this in February, COVID happened in March. And I called up my coworker and I was like, we are starting this program immediately. Like I need the help. These students need the help. We need to support each other through whatever is happening and however long it's going to happen. And so the school agreed for us to start it over Zoom. And we started with the highest level, which is the professional division here at PNB, which is the pre-pro level that's above the school and below the company, that in-between level. And It was, we were just helping them through their job search. That was what they wanted to talk about in these mentorship programs. And they didn't have any guidance in how to write a resume, how to write a cover letter, how to like just go about the whole process. And so my coworker and I were like trying to help them. And I was like, okay, well, let me just like make templates. And like what I'm going to say to these students is going to help the future students. And so I started doing it all out. And then I talked to Peter Bull, who's my artistic director. And I was like, okay, how do these templates look? You're the one who reviews all the materials. And so I started getting his feedback and I was like, well, the PDs aren't the only ones who need it. Like all these other students in the entire country need them and the world. So then I popped up a simple website and put them on there and started coaching students one-on-one, but then really mainly the PD program here. And then a year later, I just sent out an email to the top 20, actually really 40 schools in the country and was like, hey, I have this workshop series helping pre-pro dancers get jobs, helping them with their resumes. Like, do you need that for your schools? And so I've been partnered with about eight different schools growing and doing three-part workshops with them, one-on-one counseling. And so it's just been a really awesome journey that started really not me putting anything out there. It was just really realizing there was a need. And then also looking back at my 
my history, I went to School of American Ballet for 10 years and I had zero guidance on how to write a resume. My dad was an architect. My resume was based on his architecture resume, which probably really doesn't make any sense. (laughs) And I wasn't writing cover letters or making videos at that time. It was about 15 years ago. So times have changed, but I didn't have any of that guidance. So helping the, the ballet world be better moving forward, I thought this was the way that I could do it. So the kids that you work with, when you work with your one-on-one, I'm assuming they're at that kind of pre-professional level, moving into bridge levels or, or starting to look for jobs. But think back about when you were younger. One of the things we tell parents all the time is from the, t- from the time your kids decide they want to dance professionally, you need to be thinking about this very strategically. What are some of the things that you think students and their families should be thinking about. For example, we always tell kids, use your summers very strategically to get exposure, network, all of those things. But what are some of the things you would tell dancers and their families early on to be doing to kind of set themselves up to be the most marketable? I wish I had you in my corner because I had none of that guidance. I was, as I said, at SAB and we were fortunate that all of the best schools came to do with the auditions. And so that's who, where we auditioned. I literally didn't have to send a video. I didn't have to travel anywhere. It was just like literally in my home studio. So I would just on Saturdays do the three auditions that were happening that day and I would get admitted and go. So it was kind of an underlining accepted fact that like everyone went to the best programs right because we all got scholarships we got in like why wouldn't we but I wasn't really thinking strategically but now that I'm on the other side of it and the market is really very different than it was 15 years ago when I was in that position I say the same thing like use those last three to four years in school so 15 through 18 to really be strategic about not just going to the same summer program every single year. Like I loved Boston ballet. I went there every single summer and that was great. Cause I was, that was going to be my backup plan if I didn't get a job, but it, I wasn't really broadening my perspective and also broadening my network of people that I knew. And I always tell students like an audition is Yes, they are auditioning you, but you are auditioning them just as much. If you have a horrible experience in the audition class, in the summer program with one of the faculty members, you probably don't want to be there to spend a year, let alone years there. So the only way you can really do that is by experiencing it. And so how awesome that you have a two to five week summer program to kind of dip your toe in and see whether this is a good environment for you. You know, you mentioned something interesting. You said ages 15 to 18, you really want to be getting out there. And you said something about getting into the best programs that you can. And we hear this every year around summer intensive audition season that, you know, there's the the big names, the well-known programs versus smaller programs that may have less name recognition, but provide great training. Do you think the calculus changes as students get to a, a particular age? Yes and no, because again, it's that exposure and those big companies like ABT or Houston or Boston Ballet or PNB or Miami City Ballet, they're going to have like one to two contracts, but the smaller companies are likely to have more. So it's really a mixed bag. So I advise students, especially in that age 15 to 18 or 19, to try and pack in as many programs as you can during the summer. So I know a lot of programs like Philadelphia, I think it's Philadelphia or Pennsylvania Ballet has a professional experience or Miami City Ballet does. And it's like a week or two. Great. Go do that. Like have that be an experience, maybe do like a smaller, a medium ranged company and a bigger ranged company. So again, you're like, you're not just putting all your eggs in the top 10 ballet companies, you're diversifying how I advise students as they're applying to jobs is like, of course, we all want to get into ABT, New York City Ballet, Houston Ballet, but there's going to be one to two contracts available. And they just may not be looking for your height. And it's like, literally, there's nothing you can do about it. You can be the most talented person, and they don't need someone of your shape and size. Unfortunately, that's the way of the world. (laughs) I think um, for that age level, you know, the other thing we hear a lot about is company affiliated summer programs versus some of these boutique programs. Mm -hmm. And we always tell people get in front of as many companies, like you're saying, if you can do five company experiences, do five company experiences, but at a certain age, the boutique programs and the non-company affiliated programs, 
that's great if you're younger, but once you're at a certain age, you need to be in front of artistic directors. Yes. You need to be looking about looking at what companies do I want to eventually join? So if like you've never wanted to live in Texas, then like you probably shouldn't be going to Houston Ballet or Austin Ballet. Like you need, even if they're amazing programs, if if you know that's not a place you want to be, then don't spend your time doing that. Right. No, oh, well, and I also think those company experiences, you get to get in front of the artistic director, you get to dance some of their rep, the ballet masters yeah. always are teaching, and usually it's some company dancers who their side hustle is teaching, so they're teaching there too. It gives you an incredible idea of of how that company runs in two weeks, and, and you can move on to the next, and it's, it's a great evaluation. So with that, What do you think are the most important things ballet students should know about the job market? It's rough. (laughs) (laughs) What should they know about the job market? I've only been a professional dancer. I've had some non-dance jobs. So I know a little bit about what it's like to interview and get jobs not in dance, but I'm definitely no expert. But within dance, the people that you know is really 95% of how you get jobs. So whether that's a a literal like personal direct connection with a rehearsal director, or you know someone in the company can help you get the specific email of the artistic director, the secret one that they answer, or just people in your corner, like a a former teacher of yours who knows the director of a company and they can put your name in. Like it's it's really a web of who you know. Those connections are the ones that make the job search so much easier. Not easier, but just uh, smoother. (laughs) It's interesting that you say that, that, you know, you hear a lot of complaining about, well, she got her job or he got his job just because of who they knew. I just want to clarify one thing that gets them into company class. That doesn't necessarily get them the job, correct? And it allows them to kind of bypass that whole video pre-screen. You still need to, as far as I'm concerned, you still need to do the video pre-screen. And yes, it will help that company company class invitation. Right. But from my personal experience, I think it also got me my job at PNB. One of my teachers at School of American Ballet, her name's Olga Kostritsky. She's amazing, still coaching. And she's really good friends with Peter Bowl. And so when I, I, I auditioned because I was a student of Peter's when he was teaching at School of American Ballet when he was at New York City Ballet. So there was that like personal connection, but Olga really like vouched for me. And I'm sure I was like, actually, Peter told me when I was auditioning and finished company class, I went up to his office. He's like, you're great. There's a list of 15 other dancers. You're like top, you're like top five, but like I have a lot of other possibilities. And so I think she's the one who really like vouched for me to get the job to be the one out of the 15 to get the position. Wow. But again, that's not always the case. A lot of the dance world, as I'm sure you've heard from all different people, is like there is no black and white answer to anything. It's a real gray area. So that was my experience. And it could be different for other people. Sure. Sure. But what are you seeing that really does consistently help dancers have success in the job market? Mm. So that the network. Yeah. Um, and that's something that you could also really take advantage of in those summer programs and company experiences. So a teacher that you really like, try and get their email, contact information, stay in touch with them, like simple. Then also second, there are a million ways to answer this question, but second is persistence. So sending follow-ups, sending thank you notes, like just being the most courteous and aggressively advocating for yourself. I have found has been the most successful. Yeah. I mean, students always seem to hit certain barriers. And one of the big ones is height. So it seems like shorter men and taller women really do seem to struggle around audition season. Is is it simply a partnering issue? Or is it something more than that? Yeah, when I was auditioning, um, so I was at Carolina Ballet needing a new direction. And so I did a whole audition tour myself couple companies in domestically, couple companies internationally. And I got so many like, you're so beautiful. What a beautiful dancer. Blah, 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 blah. You're too tall. PNB was the only place that I got a job, which was like pretty shocking because it was my top choice. So kind of crazy that that happened. 
but it really is a partnering in in from my perspective i do believe it's a partnering issue because if you're a tall core member you need to have a tall person to match you in the core and then you need a tall dancer to dance with you so if you're a tall uh, point dancer you need a tall flat dancer to partner with you otherwise you're super limited in what you can do i mean a lot of core work is partnering unless you're coming into the company as more of a soloist principal then maybe you it's a bit easier for you because you're that unique character but yes i would agree it is harder for tall dancers and sh- uh, tall point dancers and shorter flat dancers um to get jobs and i that's it's just kind of the way of the world, unfortunately. So is there any advice that you have seen is that you do actually have personal experience that way for those kind of dancers I mean, to really, I mean, persevere through and keep going to try to find a job because there are lots of really, really talented, incredible dancers, there but are. they're just, you know, on, yeah. on both extremes of the spectrum. Yeah. Being 5'10 myself, I totally get it. And I think for a lot of my like later years training, I was trying, I was always trying to be smaller because that's who who was getting cast in things and who was doing the partnering stuff. And that's what I wanted to do. So that I was trying to be smaller, but that's actually quite the opposite. Like you need to be your unique dancer, especially if you're a tall point dancer or a shorter flat dancer, like they're going to hire you because you're that sparkly something different. So embrace it. And you're going to hear a lot of no's, but then you're going to hear that yes. And then that's going to be the place that you want to be. Because you also don't want to be in a place where they're like, no, we don't really want you, but we'll take you anyway. And then you're not going to dance at all. So you want a place that's like, yes, we want you because you're special and bring a special quality to the company that we don't have or someone just left and you can fill that position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So competition has just ended the competition season, you know, those, yeah. all of that. And the annual argument about jobs and success at competition is taking place. What correlation have you seen between success at competitions and getting an actual job? I haven't really. Excellent. Say it again. <laughs> 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 well, it's funny because I I come from a school that didn't allow us to do competitions. I'm at a company in school that doesn't allow the students to do competitions and everyone's getting getting jobs. So right. maybe it's great better for the people who are doing competitions, but I I really don't I don't think doing competitions is what's going to get you a job. It may get you a nice scholarship somewhere. Maybe you'll be one in the thousand that gets an apprenticeship position but you have maybe a better chance if you just do the audition season like a normal person that's that's actually really good advice so um you work with a lot of students right like you work with schools and their groups and then you work with individual students and you i i know i've seen some of your materials and one of the things you talk to the kids about is building a really comprehensive spreadsheet of companies they want to audition for. Can you yeah. talk about what the criteria is that you tell students to use when they're building that audition list? Yeah, I would say the main things to have on that audition list are obviously the name of the company, the name of the artistic director. Lots of companies are changing their artistic director. So really make sure you have the most current one what position that you're going to be applying to. So are you, they, everyone has a different title for something, even within the companies. Like some companies don't even have ranks or some people lowest rank is core fay and not core de ballet, or maybe they're called company dancer. So really making sure you understand what position title you're applying to. Generally, when the application dates are, when you need to send everything by, everyone's going to have something different. Also, everyone's not going to be posting until maybe February, which is like so late. So just really being on top of that, being very specific about what the the application requirements are for each company. So not sending too much information or not sending enough information, grubbing their website for whatever contact info you can. This is actually one of the most important elements to this spreadsheet is like finding an actual email to send something to and not just auditions at blah, blah, company.com. You really want to get like a physical person's email. And then as you're writing and doing research about all of these companies, what are two reasons why you want to join that company? Because then that's what you're going to, you're going to bring into your cover letter. So already as you're doing the research, write that out. 
I thought that was really interesting. As I think I told you, my son's in second, the second company of Houston Ballet. And I remember when he was first joining HB2, I sat in the background and listened in on the seminar that you did with them. And a couple of things really jumped out that I think are really important for our listeners. One, as you said, like tailor the emails. Don't have it be like a, a stock email that you just blanket send out that it really needs to be tailored to that particular company. And like, for example, if that company does a lot of Forsyth, you talk about how you love Forsyth or Balanchine or whatever it is. And then also, I thought it was really interesting that you talked to the kids about figure out what you have to offer to the company and put that up front in your cover letter. So I thought that was really interesting and it was really all about customization. So it's it's quality sometimes. Oh, I mean, it's quantity, of course, but it's also the first impression is that cover letter that they're getting. So I thought that was really interesting advice. So I actually got that from Peter Bull. So I was telling you, as I was creating Valley Life Coach, I like made a bunch of templates and I, I s- sent them up to him and was like, what do you think about these? And he's like, one of the things that I hate the most is when I read a cover letter and I know that they just copied and pasted it. Like they're not doing the work to understand why they should join this company. From the auditionee's perspective, I totally get it. You're sending to 40 different companies. You don't have the time to write a whole thing. Like it's exhausting. But just there's just make one paragraph, three sentences about why you want to join that company and do that in your research. If you do it after your research, all the companies start blending together. But as you're poking on their website, be like, I really love this repertoire. I love how diverse your dancers are. I love this outreach program that you do and I would love to be a part of it. I love that you tour to all these different cities with whatever it is. And just beyond like you have great dancers and the faculty is amazing. Like that's just very blanket. That could be for any company, but be very specific about like, okay, you like the rep. What about the rep? You like that there are a lot of new choreographers. You like that there's a mix of contemporary or ballet or there's mostly ballet or there's balancing, like whatever it is, be specific. Well, and I think this is nice to hear too, that Peter Bull actually reads those cover letters. I think a lot of people think it's a throwaway. Like, eh, it doesn't matter. I don't really need to write it. Well, the thing is about your audition materials is you don't know what they're going to read first or what they're going to touch on first. Are they going to watch your video first? Are they going to read your cover letter first? Are they going to look at your resume? Are they going to look at your photos? Like you don't know what the first touch point is. And so with all of the touch points need to be perfect and right. thoughtful. That's that's really interesting. What do you see some of the biggest mistakes that dancers make? Is it around like the making everything kind of the same or, or, you know, is it shooting too high for certain companies or not mm. having a long enough list? Like what are just some of the mistakes that you've typically seen? Two stand out. One is dancers don't start filming or making their video until like nutcracker time. And by that point you are exhausted, potentially injured. There's no studio space, like whatever, like start your audition in I know it sounds so early but like September October and you don't have that doesn't have to be your final draft like you're just starting to do like film yourself doing things and like maybe you you do a couple drafts but at least you have something because I've seen so many dancers unfortunately get injured during Nutcracker they're like oh I was planning on filming in December get injured during Nutcracker, and then they literally have nothing to send companies. And I'm like, if you had just done a draft of like, maybe not the best version of your variation, you would have had something to send. So starting your video filming process earlier rather than later, I advise, let's say October. September is maybe like you're getting back in shape after the summer, you need to rest your body, but start in October doing drafts get your combinations, figure out your variations, rehearse yourself, film yourself every rehearsal, not to be like super critical of yourself, but again, just to have the drafts of the variations. Um, I have seen many dancers like obsessively watch themselves and be like, oh, I'm so terrible at Like just have them as drafts. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, they don't advocate for themselves. So they send their email, it goes to the black hole and they assume people read it. You need to be following up within two to three weeks after you've sent your application, just ensuring that they've received it, making sure they don't need anything else. Like you just got to keep like putting your foot in the door and keeping it open for yourself. It may shut on your on your face, but at least you're giving yourself the most opportunity to be successful. I would say 
three follow-up emails is appropriate. More than three is a bit aggressive and maybe frowned upon. So be wise about how you send those, but do send them. There are a variety of ways for dancers to get in front of artistic directors. Is there one specific path that you try to follow or try to encourage your dancers to whom you work with to follow? P&B is very lucky with their PD program that they have artistic directors come to observe class or even teach class. And that has had a huge success rate. I know a lot of programs don't have that capability. But if your program does take full advantage, come with your resume, bring it to the director, talk to the director afterwards, be like, this was such a wonderful class. Like, I'd love to stay, whatever it is, make that connection if you have that ability. Otherwise, the most successful results have been if you asked and you're invited to take a company class. I Now they're doing like private auditions go to them i know that a cost is a huge barrier travel time getting time off from whatever rehearsal process or performance process is going on at your program but you getting a job is the priority and i hopefully the school supports you in that so just be very clear in communicating with your program that you were invited to this private audition or company class it's really important that you go bonus tip Tip is always make sure to try and stay wherever you're g- going for at least two days so that you're not just going once and then leaving. Obviously, if time is a constraint and money is a constraint, do what you need to do. But traveling there, again, is you auditioning them as much as they're auditioning you if you've never been there before. That was actually a huge surprise for me when my son was going through this is I had no idea that friends could bring people into company class and then Mm -hmm. just take class. And that's actually how my son got his job is he went into company class with a friend who was in the company. And the plan was just that he was going to be in town and they were going to have dinner and she invited him to come take class. And he went. And when he got back, everyone was like, wait, how'd you do that? And he said, I just, I just went. And I didn't realize that that is even a thing that company members can bring people to class. And obviously a company member is not going to bring somebody who they don't think is a good fit, but it goes back to your point about networking. Mm -hmm. You bypass so much of that headache if you have friends in companies that are willing to bring you in to take class for a couple of days. So fun fact, that's how I got my audition at Mm PNB. So I'd like sent my things, went to the black hole, didn't hear anything. And then I text messaged or Instagrammed my friend who was in the company at the time. And I was like, Hey, I sent my application. Haven't heard anything. I'm, I had gotten and planned a audition at OBT. So I was going to be on the West coast anyways. So it's like, I'd love to go to PNB. It's my dream company. I'm probably not going to get in, but like, while I'm over there, might as well go check, check it out. And he's like, Oh yeah, no, you have to send it to this email. So I sent to the email and they're like, oh yeah, 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 you can come whenever, but we're not, we're not accepting like new dancers because our, all our contracts are full. And I was like, that's fine. I'm just going to come take class. I'm going to be on the West coast. And then that's how this whole thing spiraled. All of a sudden, like eight dancers didn't renew their contracts. There were spots available. I got the job. So if I hadn't like kind of had that in, I would have been in the black hole. Well, and everyone talks about a little bit of luck, right? Right place, right time. And 100%. and all of a sudden, you know, a little bit of pixie dust and things can kind of, uh, you know, maybe sometimes work work your way. So there is a perception by a lot of parents that a lot of things happen behind the scenes. For example, that artistic directors of schools can just snap their finger, pick up the phone and get their favorite students jobs. How truthful is this? Hmm. I would say 95% not true. There's always that 5% that you you don't know. <laughs> but from my experience, the relationship between schools and companies, they're d- different animals. They like almost don't even speak to each other. I know the pre-pro level is like this weird in between the two, which is why they end up being like kind of left to figure out what they need to do on their own because they're not really part of the school. They're not really part of the company. Sometimes that is true, but I would say majority of the time there isn't that much behind the scenes, again, from my perspective and what I know. So with with the job market, it's Mm. fierce. Like we all know that. We know there's like this huge bottleneck after COVID and stuff. And as, as dancers are sending out resumes and going to auditions, what's your advice to the students that you work with 
in terms of company offers, like for example, somebody gets an offer with a really small company or they get an offer for short-term work, neither of which necessarily pays a living wage, but it's that or, or nothing. What's your advice to the, the kids that you work with? Mm, that's a really, it's a tough situation. It is best on your resume to be somewhere and work and continue to build your repertoire and have like a current job that looks a lot more attractive to an artistic director than someone who took a year off to take class, stay in shape and then do the audition process again. I know that's not always a possibility. And I know financially, that's always not a possibility. So there are a lot of barriers there. But if you have the ability financially to be able to take one of those either a smaller company or a part-time gig job do it and if you need to have a part-time job while you're doing that communicate that clearly with the company that you will be joining and just saying like I really want to do this but I need to be able to support myself I need to work at Starbucks these and these times and I'm going to work around the schedule as best as I can you can always make things work you think so that there is, I mean, there's a little bit of a perception that it's really hard to go from a very, very small company to a medium sized company or to a large company. Do you think that's a myth? Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. I think there's a real yeah. perception out there among students that that's the case. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's easy. You're in a smaller company and you want to, you want to move to a different company, whether it's higher up in ranking company or just a different company and auditioning while you're working full time is like, never easy. So I'm not saying it's a walk in the park to just be able to like transition from this company to that company. But it is possible. As I said, in the previous question, like it's far better for you to be employed somewhere to then be able to transition wherever it is you're going next. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other thing that um, we really wanted to talk to you about was kind of the numbers game. And we just finished doing a series on postgraduate programs. So we've interviewed artistic directors at different schools that have, you know, trainee level, second company, studio company, whatever you want to call it. And the numbers right now of slots and students in that bridge level versus the number of jobs that are available, there's a real discrepancy right now. What are your thoughts on kind of how we might reframe the language and also expectation settings with students and families as it relates to going into a post-grad level and then ultimately getting a job? Oh, it's real rough. I would say, as we talked about earlier, the data is what where the answers really lie. From my experience, students in the top, let's say 10 companies that have pre-pro graduate programs are the most likely to transition into that company or other companies, Mm -hmm. um, be a feeder for other companies. And the kind of more regional, smaller budget companies that have these graduate programs, it is harder (laughs) because they're just aren't there. They're, they're more feeders within the companies than they are feeders into other companies. So knowing that like you're joining a graduate program, there are probably going to be, let's say, one to five jobs available within that company, more on the smaller side. And if you're in one of those top 10 graduate programs, again, you have that like one to five spots within that company, but then you have more reach um, and connections with other companies. But if you're in a smaller company, you really only have those few jobs within that company. It's a lot harder for you to get jobs elsewhere. Again, there can always be an anomaly. It's not black or white, but that's been my experience. And do you ever have to have the hard conversations with your the kids you work with that, you know, you've sent out all these audition materials and nothing's happening that maybe you might need to start looking at an alternative path? I've been very fortunate that I've been able to place most of my students in our clients in positions. They may not be the ones that they dreamed and hoped of, but it's, as I was saying, like it was something to bridge whatever is the next thing for them, whether that's like part-time gig work or that's apprenticeship somewhere. 
So I've been fortunate in that position. But yeah, there is a student that I'm working with who is determining like, do I do a second year in this pre-pro program or another pre-pro program? But then my parents want me to go to college. So like, what do I do? So it's just like weighing the different options, but there is always an option Okay, I have found. Cecilia, you've given us so much of your time and we'd love to have you back for a part two because we like Let's do weren't it. <laughs> able to do nearly the questions that we'd want to. So we'd love to do this as a two-part series if we can. Let's do it. Um, Let's do so it. So if you wouldn't mind, we'd like to end on a question, the, this question of what advice you have for parents as their dancers hit the audition circuit for jobs, what level of involvement should they really have? Ooh, that's a good one. There's a fine line of being super involved in your student's journey, and you obviously want them to be successful and to get a job. But I have found the most success in students are the ones that are self-motivated to do it themselves. Of course, they all need guidance. They all need to be told what to do, but you cannot hold their hand the entire time. So I think being there to check in with them and be like, how many companies have you sent out to? Have you finished your video? Kind of doing like kind check-ins to kind of poke and make sure they're on the right track. And proofreading, I, I always tell students, send your resume to your friends and your parents and your aunts and your uncles to like just proofread them. So be there to to support in the check, but allowing the students to find their own path, have them start to learn how to advocate for themselves. And you can help guide, but doing it for them, I think is a disservice to them to grow into the adults that they can shine to be. I think that's an amazing place to stop. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you would like to learn more about Cecilia or Ballet Life Coach, please visit our show notes. Please take a moment and subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Also, swipe that auto download button so you never miss an episode. It really helps others find our podcast. Also, we would like to thank a few of our patrons who went over to BalletHelpDesk.com and clicked on the support us button. It really helps keep all of our content free for everyone. We would like to thank Ashley, Chris, and Kara. We really appreciate your support. Until next time, the help desk is now closed.